Kia ora te whanau. Welcome to Grace at Your Place. So great that you can join us today. In a moment, we're going to hear a great message from one of our team. But before that, we're going to go into a time of worship. Let me pray. Father God, we just thank you so much. You're such a great Father to us. And we can just worship you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
You know, it's always interesting to me that there is a spiritual battle that goes on when people come to get baptised. And the few little disturbances this morning, and it always just reminds me that there is, there is a battle that goes on. And some people within their hearts have this tremendous struggle to get baptised. And um, there is a demonic thing that needs to be broken often before a person can come to that place. It is such a powerful thing that happens when a person gets baptised. So I wanna talk about baptism today, but I wanna tie it into the topic we're going into next week, which is our legacy season. And uh, you probably know that every year we have what's called a legacy season and uh, we're raising money for our new city campus buildings in Chewham Street. You may not know that we don't own this building, we just rent it. And um, we've been in this building for about 23 years. We only owned it for about two of those years and then the earthquakes came and um, did its damage and we got a payout, which was wonderful. And so we bought a building, we paid $6 million for a building in Chewham Street, which we fully paid off in about two years. And now we are raising money to, um, to fit it out um, you know, even today, if we just put the two services from the morning, we would pretty much fill up the uh, new auditorium of what we've got. So it's very exciting what God's doing. More people are coming, people are coming to know Jesus and it's also been the base for us to plant out other churches. You probably know that we have six churches uh, around Canterbury and uh, also it's the base by which uh, we're able to send out missionaries. We're doing an enormous amount of local mission and mission overseas as well. But it all comes because God has brought us together as a family. And so one of the things when we've been praying at this year, this year and asking God, what is the theme that we're to have? God's been talking about the fact that we are deep community. And so we were talking about this and I've been talking about this in three different forums. Our own pastors of Grace Vineyard Church, you probably know I'm the National Director of the Vineyard Churches of New Zealand and God's brought it up in that forum as well, our national leaders. And also when I went to our global conference overseas, the international leaders have been saying it as well. God wants us to become closer as family. It's this theme that each place I go within our movement, God's talking to us uh, about family, about a, a deepness of family. And at one stage, uh, we had a pastor couple that we were talking to in one of these meetings after we'd been praying. And she said, she's of Māori background, and she said, you know, the term that is in Māori for this that really doesn't have a, a Western English equivalent is the word whanongatanga. And whanongatanga is this deep sense of family. It's, it's not like just mum, dad and the kids, but... You know, even mum, dad and the kids, the nuclear family is actually not a biblical concept. We think it is a biblical concept because it's nice for us as Western Christians, but uh, biblically, the family was mum, dad and the kids and granny and granddad and nana and pops and aunts and uncles and uh, people who might be single and other people who, um, you know, may, may have disabilities and, and the servants and a whole lot of people. It was called the household. And that was the family of the New Testament. And that family, that household, or the Greek word is oikos, that household was part of the wider tribe that the Jewish person belonged to. So there's this tribe, you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel. They belonged to a tribe. Then they would have a village and that was a sense of family. And then they would have their own family, the oikos or the household. And that's where the church was birthed. It was birthed into that sort of a context. Whereas we as Westerners, we just we live as individuals. And, uh, you know, we may have other contacts and, and things. We've got friends and people that are close to us, but we very much live our lives by ourselves. And so any word that we use to talk about family or anything, uh, you know, like, like the Māori word for, for nongatanga, we have to explain it because we don't have a word that actually fits in with the New Testament. But Māori people do because Māori people grew up in tribes. 
You know, traditionally you're part of a, a tribe, part of an iwi. You know, there's, there's the big part of the tribe and then there's the smaller part of the tribe and then there's the families. And it's quite a lovely thing. I was in Rotorua recently showing a guest around and the guy that uh, was there was saying hi to everybody. He's saying, he's my cousin, he's my cousin and, and he's my cousin, there's my cousin over there. And he said, you may think this is funny, me saying these are my cousins, but he said, they actually are my cousins. We're all related to each other. And you know, there is that sense of connectedness that often there is with, with Māori people. And that's common in, in a large part of the world where people grow up in villages. But in the West, we don't have it. We have to have it explained. And often when we look at it in the context of the Bible, it feels like a cult. I mean, who would share their stuff? And who would, who would help each other out, you know, and live in a, in a, in a community type way? Who would do that? Only weird people do that, you know, we often think. People that come up on the news, groups that come up on the news that shut themselves away and, and get armed or whatever they do. And we look at it, but you know, part of it is actually a very biblical concept, but not the part about separating yourself from the world. You know, the, 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 the original church was in the world and they were inviting the world to come in and they were going out into the world. So this word that we're gonna pick up next week, whanongatanga, which means a deep sense of family, is a very, very biblical concept. Uh, in the Bible, the Greek word that is used is koinonia. And once again, there is no adequate English equivalent word. Uh, the the uh, translators put the word fellowship, but who uses the word fellowship? You know, when you're at work, you don't say, hey, do you wanna go to the pub and have some fellowship? You know what I mean? People don't talk like that. We don't use that word. It's a very spiritual word. But, but it grasps a little bit of the concept, this koinonia. It means deep community. It means intimacy. It means sharing. It's joint participation, communion, fellowship, something that's done together. It talks about team. There's a relatedness. See, I've got to give a whole lot of words to be able to explain what it means, but it is very biblical. Now I read somewhere, and I'm not sure whether this is 100% correct, but I heard somewhere that the word koinonia was a Greek word that was actually created to describe what the Christians had. Because even though the Jews had these amazing sense of family and villages and things, what the Christians had was a stage deeper as well. And this is what God is calling us back to. He is calling us back to koinonia. He's calling us to whanangatanga, this incredible sense of being intermingled and living in each other's lives. And we see it described in the early church, Acts 2.42. It's just so well known. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to koinonia, whanangatanga, translated fellowship, this deep sense of communion. They devoted themselves. In other words, they said, this is one of the things that I'm gonna promise we do. We're gonna follow the teachings of the apostles, which is the the gospel. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna commit ourselves to koinonia, to whanangatanga, to being devoted to one another, to share meals and to prayer. That's what they committed to. And then we see a couple of verses onwards in verse 44. All the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. Now that is radical in our Western society. Not radical for Maori people and tribes and Polynesian people and, and from different islands and people from all over the planet live like this. But it says here, they did radical things even for the time. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the good will of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now we look at this and we think to ourselves, well, there's no way that we in the 21st century could achieve anything like that. But you know, I think God's calling us to try. And it doesn't mean that we live in a commune and it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, we're just giving stuff away to everybody, but there's this sense of connectedness. There's this sense of responsibility for other people because they are our Christian brothers and sisters. And I was just sitting here today and just uh, looking at what we can do when we come together. 
I was looking at our wonderful worship team and I thought, wow, this is awesome. I couldn't get up and do all the stuff that they do. We had a little security incident before and we had all these guys that uh, went and were, were just coming to help. And we've got people serving, you know, in different capacities. We've got um, Becca doing uh, the, the baptism and, and just so many, and people are giving to make it all happen. I mean, the lights, you know, the electricity, somebody pays for it. Somebody pays for the toilet paper, all the cookies and coffee and stuff afterwards. People pay for that. Do you realise there are people coming to church for the first time every single week in the last few weeks? We've had people who have never been to church before And they're coming along and it's all provided because there is a sense of family. People aren't coming along and thinking, oh, I'm just paying for me and my family. People are coming along and saying, I am providing for the work that God is doing in this city. So you provide, yes, you are providing for your family. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're providing for the family that's sitting next to you and the one behind you, the people that you know and those that you don't know. We had the lovely Suzanne that uh, came today in the first service. She's from Germany. And she's arrived and she's been looking at faith and suddenly she thinks, this is it. I wanna make the decision. I wanna get baptised. And she's come into a family that's able to welcome her and say, come on in. We want to welcome you to our our part of the family. Just recently, um, we've had numbers of people that have come in from overseas and they've walked and they've come from troubled backgrounds and they come in here and they have been helped. We had a person that came a couple of weeks ago with a horrible situation, come from overseas and one of our young people went up and said, God's going to meet you and you've been going through a lot of stuff didn't know anything about the circumstances. The man broke down and, and wept. And so we as a church have been able to help in this incredibly complex situation that's been going on. But it's a family thing. And I feel so proud that we can welcome people with all the issues they're going through into the family that we have here. And that's the way it is. It starts with an understanding that it's not just about me and my family but it's about what God's calling me to do in the wider family. And so you may not be a person that's up front. You may not be a person that's necessarily, you know, handing out bulletins or handing out chocolate or or whatever, but all of us can play a part because we're thinking to ourselves, what are the finances, gifts, talents, abilities that I have that can bless the greater number? And, you know, people say to me all the time, oh, you know, um, such and such has gone to this place because they like being in a very small community. And that's cool if you want to be just in a small place. I love being in a place that's large because we can change the world. We can change the world. The more people there are, the more talents and um, resources that we combine, we can do incredible things. And I love the fact that when a lot of people come together, we can do more than when it's just me all by myself. We can, we can do something that actually changes the world, something that becomes phenomenal. That's what happens. You know, the, the Bible says that uh, the early church was a family and that the church today is supposed to be a family. It uses that Greek word oikos, which means household. Not mum, dad and the kids, but the wider family, oikos. But it also uses another metaphor and it's the metaphor of the body. Over and over again in the New Testament, Paul says, when you join church, you are joining the body of Christ. And the body of Christ always means the church. And so sometimes it talks about family, sometimes it talks about the body. And it's this incredible thing. Think what a body is. It is permanently connected, unless you're doing some terrible violence, your body is permanently connected to, 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 to all the different parts. And that's what uh, Paul is saying. You know, we've got fingers and we've got hands and we've got arms and we've got shoulders. We've, you know, it's like heads and shoulders, knees and toes, isn't it? You've got all these different parts and that's what the Christian family is like. And the head which runs it all is Jesus. But I want to tell you today, and this is where we come to the baptism part, do you realise that the way we get into the family is through baptism? The way we become part of the Christian family is through baptism. Now, you can join a club, you know, you might 
you know, join a club by paying some huge amount of money or you might join by sitting a test or you might need to be a male or a female or you might have to qualify in, in some sort of way. The way to get into the Christian church is through baptism. I mean, anyone's welcome to come and join us and, and belong to us, no, no matter who they are or what they've done. But to spiritually enter in, there's this thing called baptism. And so let's have a look at how it's described as being something that spiritually happens to us that joins us with the rest of the family of God. 1 Corinthians 12 is 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ, the church. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slave and some are free. I mean, just stop there for a second. I mean, these were enemies, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews didn't have anything to do with the Gentiles. They didn't even invite them into their homes. And yet suddenly they're all part of the same family. And then there were slaves in those days. And they were saying, you know, suddenly we've become equal. The slaves are coming in and part of the family with the masters. And in other places it says the males and the females because the males and females were were separate classes. And it, it says, you know, in Christ we become a family. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, a Samaritan, whether you're a Greek, it says in other places, whether you're a male or a female, or if you're a slave or you're free, together we become part of God's family. But listen to this. But we've all been baptised into one body by one Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. So he's talking about the body. We're all a whole lot of different people. We can even see looking around, we come from different parts of the world and different cultures. We hear how do we become spiritually part of God? We get baptised into the body by the Holy Spirit and we share the same Spirit. All of us have got the same Holy Spirit living within us. And so when you go up to a person, no matter where they come from, no matter what the shade of their skin, no matter what language they speak, the Spirit in me recognises the Spirit in them and we know that we are family. And how does that happen? It happens through baptism. So, you know, uh, this word baptism is actually an interesting word. Uh, It's the Greek word baptizo, and it means to submerge, soak or drench. It's not just dipping something in. It's actually really getting it and having it completely soaked. I looked at other ways the word baptizo was used uh, in Greek. And uh, one of the things is the process that you use for dyeing material. Where you get material and you put it under, get the dye to go through it and you leave it in there until the dye soaks completely through, till it's completely drenched. That's baptizo. Um, Another one can be, uh, in fact, I looked up this thing. There's a guy, a Greek poet and physician. Interesting the things you find when you're doing research. His name was Nikanda and he was uh, a poet physician around 200 years before Christ. And he talks about how to make pickles. That's interesting, interesting research, isn't it? And he talks, he says, there are, they mentions two words, bapto, the Greek word bapto. He said, that's where you just dip the vegetable in to clean it. Just dip it in, pull it out. But the word baptizo, when you're uh, making pickled fruit, he said, what you do, or pickled vegetables, what you do is he said, you leave it in, you baptizo it, you baptize it, you drench it in the vinegar, it says. So that's the difference between bapto, dipping it in, and baptizo, which is absolutely having it drenched. It's like marinating. After the baptism, after the the, the drenching, the marinade, that thing will never be the same again. It has been absolutely drenched by whatever the flavour is. And friends, that's what happens when we get baptised. The Holy Spirit comes and He drenches us through. We get changed forever. And so when we get baptised, we actually spiritually change. One of the things I learned when I was uh, researching this, uh, let's look at Matthew 28 verse 19. This is part of the Great Commission. Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what the commentator said about this was that when it says to baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, that's actually an incorrect translation. The word in is not correct. It's supposed to be into. 
and it, it denotes movement, that something is changing location. So it's going from the outside into something. So it says, when you're getting baptised, you're getting baptised into the Father and into the Son and into the Holy Spirit. You're actually becoming part of them. God drenches us. We are allowing ourselves to actually have God become part of us or us become part of God. And we see this in Galatians 3 verse 27. It says, All who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. So, so when you get baptised the three this morning and one in the service before, I think we've got about 40 baptisms around our campuses uh, today. And what, what it's actually saying is that we're actually putting on Jesus. We are permanently joining to Jesus. We become indistinguishable between Him and us. I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me. That's what happens when we become joined together. But also what it's saying is that we are instantly joined together with God's spiritual family. When you go into those waters, something spiritual happens to you. When you come out, you can, you have a family tie, a spiritual tie with every other person that is a believer, every other person that's been baptised. You belong to them and they belong to you. Friends, that is very different to any other type of relationship. It's different to just a blood relationship. Us, like our mums and dads and our children or brothers and sisters, they're very important relationships. But there is something even deeper than that, which is the spiritual relationship that comes from having God as our Father, us having been baptised and joined together in the Spirit. Uh, verse 27, Galatians 3, verse 27, again, and all who've been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. So we've become completely changed. Baptism is also the representation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Romans 6 verse 3, Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, there it is again, we've been joined with Him, we joined Him in His death. And the Bible in a number of places talks about the fact that when we go under the waters, there is we are uh, joining with Jesus in His death. And then when we come out, we're joining with Him in His resurrection. There's the sense that we die with Jesus and we're raised with Jesus. So um, have we forgotten that we're joining Him in His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Something incredibly powerful that happens when we're in that baptism pool. It also represents the fact that Jesus has washed our sin away by dying for us and rising in. Another meaning of the word baptizo is to thoroughly wash or to thoroughly clean something. In 1 Peter 3 verse 21, it says, And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing the dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So why should we get baptised? I bumped into one or two people in this last week who have been asking questions about baptism. And people say, you know, do I need to get baptised? I'm a Christian and I've been a Christian since this height. You know, do I need to? And the answer is yes, because Jesus says so. Jesus says to get baptised. And so we see this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not saved if we don't get baptised. And it doesn't mean we don't have the Holy Spirit if we don't get baptised. But the command is that when we repent, that we do get baptised, that those things are together. And part of it is an incredible mystery. You know, it seems that, you know, many people say it's a symbol and it is a symbol, but obviously something very powerful happens spiritually when we get baptised. And so there is a battle that goes on that, that, that will stop people. I've seen people that want to get baptised and then at the last second they can't. And then they say they do and they regret and, and then they don't at the last minute or something goes wrong. There seems to be this battle and that leads me more and more to uh, realise why would there be a battle if the devil did not want us to get baptised? It is such a powerful thing to do. 
And Jesus commanded it as well in Mark 16, verse 16. Anyone who believes and is baptised will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. So there's the implication there that people just refuse to do it. Well, I'm not gonna do it. I've decided to do something else or I don't need to or whatever. And so this, there's this sort of defiance that comes. So it is an important thing that uh, we, if we haven't been baptised, some people have been baptised or christened as children and uh, that's a decision people have to make if they wanna be baptised as an adult. Uh, what we do in our church is we dedicate children and we baptise adults and we tend to fully immerse people as well. And um, not that those things are, you know, overly technical. If a person goes under and they miss a little bit on the forehead, we don't consider them unbaptised. But uh, it really comes down to the attitude of the heart. And look, some people don't want to do it because they don't think it's important. Others don't do it because it's a matter of pride. And people just don't want to be put on public display. And that's a bad reason to not get baptised because it's saying I'm just too proud to do it. And uh, I would just ask the question, if you can't be baptised with fellow Christians around, how could you survive with your faith uh, in a world that is full of non-Christians? And so I would, I would challenge people to do it. It is, it is such an important thing to do. Um, another reason for doing it is that uh, it, is, it is part of belonging. You know, the Bible says we are baptised into the family. And uh, that, that is a powerful thing in and of itself. I'm so thrilled that uh, anywhere I go in the world, I can go into a Christian church and I know there's a sense that I belong. We've had people that have come in here, as I said earlier on, and they've needed help, they've needed prayer. I remember when I've been overseas uh, or I've been away working one time, I got sick and I thought I need prayer. And so I thought I'll just go to the local church and I looked up to try and see a, a church that would believe in the power of prayer and I found one and the pastor came and prayed for me. And another time I was overseas and I got unwell and I thought, first thing I wanna do is go and find a church where they will pray for me. So I asked around, where is there a church where they believe in healing prayer? And I went and, and, and got prayed for there. There's something about belonging and we get to join with a billion people around the world. Um, I love roast dinners and I'm not trying to invite myself to your place, but I love roast dinners. And um, some of our friends recently joined a local workingmen's club because um, they have cheap, cheap roast meals there and, that they, and they live near one. So they said, hey, would you like to come to a workingmen's club with us and we'll have a cheap roast meal? And I was put my hand up straight away. It was great. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do in a workingmen's club that don't interest me particularly, but um, the roast meals are good. So we went along there, there was a little group of us and we all decided we'd join up. I mean, it was $10. And, and the thing that I discovered is that when you got this little card, and I'm not doing this as a plug, um, but you suddenly belong to a whole lot of other workingmen's clubs as well. I thought, wow, I, you know, I can just rock on up to these places and show my little workingman's card. And um, I suppose these days would be working person's card. And I'd show that and I can just have a roast meal there. And I actually know of a workingman's club that's got a great car park right next to a mall. And I've often thought to myself, if I joined that workingman's club, I could get to park in a good place. So I'm gonna keep that in mind if I ever am going to that mall that I can actually just, just park near there. But the point is... The point is, when you belong to something, you know, you belong to something that's, you know, that, that, that has branches all over the place. And I belong to the worldwide church of Jesus. I belong to His family. And most of you do as well, which means I can go into a place that doesn't even speak the same language. They have a completely different culture. They dress in a different way, but I know that I am family. There is something joining me together with those things. Isn't that a cool thing? One of the things I love the most is when my grandbabies come over. So we've got four grandbabies now. Isn't that cool? Just had another one the other day. So a little baby Samuel. When they come to our place, they just treat it like their own home. You know, they, um, I usually go out and welcome them and give them cuddles and things. And they, they march and they go straight to the pantry and, you know, they want treats and, and, and they just treat it like it's their own home because actually it is. It's, it's their own home, like, like they've got their toys there, they've got their books, they've got clothes there. They, it's just their place. And you know, that's how it is in the Christian family. It should be that when we're with each other, that we feel a real sense of being at home, that this 
there's this incredible sense of connectedness. That if there is, you know, um, my little grandson, Marley, he knows that if he wants something, he asks Papa, because Papa's the weak link. So he asks Mum and Dad, can I have a Spider-Man outfit? And they say, no, we're not gonna get it. He said, I'll ask Papa, you know? <laughs> Papa's the weak link, you know? Or he asks if he can have a treat and they say, no, you've already had enough today. So he comes up and whispers in my ear, he says, Papa, can I have a treat? And he knows Mr. Mr. Weak Link is gonna, you know, probably talk to mum and dad or sneak him something, you know? And, and, and isn't that a wonderful thing that, uh, well, maybe not for the parents, maybe not for the parents. Isn't it a wonderful thing that there's this sense that I'm in this family that looks after me. I'm in this family that cares about me. I'm in this family that provides for needs. And one of the things I love about our Grace family is there's a tremendous sense of helping one another. You know, there have been so many occasions that have happened over the years where somebody gets into trouble and uh, we say, hey, such and such is in trouble. And suddenly you've got a whole team of people around at their house or taking up love offerings for them or helping them in some, some different way. And that is one of the beautiful things about being family. I get phone calls from pastors, sometimes pastors I don't even know. And they say, hey, we know this person that's in Christchurch, they've got this issue that's come up. Could we send them along to you to look after them? And I may not know them, I may not even know the pastor, but there is this sense, there's this camaraderie, there's this sense of family where we can ring people up and say, hey, these, part, these people are part of our wider family. Can you look after them? Can you, can you care for them? And can you make them part of your family as well? Don't you think that's an awesome thing? So this whanangatanga, this quinonia, this deep sense of family, this is what the Holy Spirit is inviting us into. He's inviting us to come along and not just treat this like a picture theatre where we all just sort of wave generically to each other, but we think, I'm connected to you and I'm connected to you and I'm connected to you. We are brothers and sisters. We have God as our Father. We are the children of God. And what He's given to me, He expects me to share with others. And because He's given so much to so many different people, He's given gifts and talents and abilities and given different ones to everyone, it means that all of us can do incredible things when we pull those things together. Think of the human body. Think of the finger. I'm I'm so pleased I've got fingers, I can pick things up but I couldn't use my fingers if I didn't have the hand. The hand would be useful without, useless without the arm and so on and so on. We need each other to do things. And so when we go to pick something up, I need the muscles, I need the brain, I need nerves, I need you know, the connections, the skin, I need the blood. And it's exactly the same with the mission we do. When we join together as spiritual family, we bring the gifts and talents and abilities and finances together and we say, let's pull this together and let's do something awesome for the Kingdom of God. And we are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Finally, Galatians 3 verse 26, it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. We are the children of God and we are connected spiritually because of the baptism we have. We have the same Holy Spirit. As you go out today, you look around and you think to yourself, that is my brother, that is my sister. They have the same Holy Spirit in them. I'm responsible for that person and they're responsible for me. If they have a need, there may be some way that I'm gonna be called on to actually help them. And together as a body, God is calling us to do mission, not only in this region of Canterbury, but across Aotearoa and to the uttermost parts.